Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Book of Acts. And now we've come to Lesson 5 for August 4 of 2018 on the conversion of Paul, probably the most dramatic event in this whole book. So we'll see what we can learn about that conversion, what led up to it, what the results were, and so forth. But as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to worship you, to enjoy your word as we study together. It's such a privilege that we have here as the freedom of this country to uh, share with each other as we, as we study together. Be with those who are listening in that uh, they may gain something of benefit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think there's probably not any argument about the fact that this is the most incredible single experience in the history of the early Christian church. The conversion of Paul, that event which took place on the road to Damascus. And of course we'll, we'll look at that in, in more detail as we work our way through. The impact of Paul or earlier called Saul on the early Christian church is beyond computation. Paul and Saul and his friend Dr. Luke, he converted into Christianity, wrote most of the New Testament. So think about what kind of an impact that's had on Christianity. Probably no one else in the history of the church, Christian church has had a larger impact on the church as a whole than this one individual. The incredible thing is that when he first, we first hear about Saul, he was adamantly opposed to the Christian church and everything it stood for. He believed that Jesus was an imposter, but after the experience on the Damascus Road, an absolutely incredible change took place. And Gary, I think you're going to tell us about that. Yes. From among the most bitter and relentless persecutors of the Church of Christ arose the ablest defender and most successful herald of the gospel. With the apostolic brotherhood of the Chosen Twelve, who had accompanied with Christ from his baptism even to his ascension, was numbered one who had never seen the Lord while he dwelt among men, and who had heard his name uttered only in unbelief and contempt. But beneath the blindness and bigotry of the zealot and the Pharisee, infinite wisdom discerned a heart loyal to truth and duty. And the voice from heaven made itself heard above the clamors of pride and prejudice, prejudice rather. In the prom promulgation of the gospel, divine providence would unite with the zeal and devotion of the Galilean peasants, the fiery vigor and intellectual power of a rabbi of Jerusalem. To lead the battle against pagan philosophy and Jewish formalism, was chosen one who had himself witnessed the debasing power of heathen worship and endured the spiritual bondage of Pharisaic exaction. It comes from Sketches from Life of Paul, page 9, paragraph 1 through page 10. Wow. That's quite an experience, quite a change, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Think about now, try to put yourself in the, in the shoes of Paul. How would you feel later in life as you're spreading the Christian gospel, recognizing that you had been through this experience, you had this incredible education, probably the best education available in the world at that time, and yet you had this irresistible determination to destroy the Christian church? How would you feel about yourself? Well, we're going to see what he said about himself a little bit later. Obviously, he must have had a false concept of God. Absolutely. In order, in order to, and, yeah. it, and it wasn't that he hadn't been a student. No. It, it's uh, his presuppositions it is, ended up. But the realization of that when he's older and wiser, how did he deal with that? <coughs> well, yeah. He said, I'm the least. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that changed at his conversion is his per perception of God. Exactly. That's yes. all. Yeah. His paradigm. And it wasn't that, that he didn't right. have the text. The, the everything yeah, else, nothing, nothing else changed. Yeah. Yeah. Only that. Yeah. 
But when he was blinded, that certainly brought him up with a jolt, and he had room to think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you thought about it all of a sudden, bang, and you can't yes. see and think, am I going to be like this for the rest of my life? Exactly. Whew. And there's one thing to have, have all the texts, and, uh, but if, if you don't put it together in a model, it makes some sense. I think about years ago. Uh, we don't have to encourage anybody to throw out their Bible. No. It's just to... Uh, Take those stories and, and don't have to ignore the stories that you had. Take them and remodel them into something that is rational. Mm -hmm. Read them with different lenses. Well, yeah. <coughs> same thing. We read the gospel. Excuse me. Read the Old Testament with the lens of of the gospels. Exactly. Yes, yeah, interesting. Here at the end of this passage, heathen worship. You know, I mean, the temple was not called the den of thieves for nothing. <laughs> it, That's right. <laughs> Well, it was a heathen worship. Yeah, it was the first stock market. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but yeah. remember, that he grew up in, in grew up in Tarsus, where I'm sure there was plenty. I mean, that was the place where Cleopatra met Anthony, and you know, whatever wow. the kinds of things that happened there. So, what was it that made Paul? That what did God see in Paul that made him, you know, bam, <laughs> knock him down on the road? He had zeal, number one. Yeah, he had zeal. And he had zeal even for, you know, to hurt and the wicked, those whom he considered wicked. But he also had sincerity of heart, which mm -hmm. probably is what God recognized in Paul. Well, let's think about Paul now. He was what we call a Hellenistic Jew. What does that mean? A Greek Jew, uh, Jew yeah. Greek background. Mean that he grew up speaking Greek? That, that was, that in other words, he was a Jew that grew up outside of Judaism. Now, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean he didn't understand Judaism. He understood Judaism very well. But he grew up in Cilicia, in uh, where the, prominent, the language was Greek. In fact, Tarsus, where he was born and raised, was the capital of Cilicia at that point. And that's Turkey today. That's an area in the south-central part of, of Turkey today. Uh, at quite a young age, we don't know exactly what age, he was sent off to Jerusalem by his parents to get the very best possible education. And who did he end up working under? Gamaliel. Gamaliel. What do we know about Gamaliel? He's the one that convinced the Sanhedrin not to, yes. um, not kill. to kill Peter and Paul. Oh. Peter, Peter and, and John. John. Oh. Peter and John. Yeah. He said, right after the... Uh, so what, what we're saying here is Gamaliel said he was one of the cooler heads. He said, let's, let's think logically through this, brethren, before we, before we do something that would, will be a mistake. Let's think about what we're, what we're trying to do right here. What, do you, what impact do you suppose Gamaliel had on Paul? I mean, Paul must have thought him, of him as a, as a second father, oh. surely. I always wondered what, what uh, he, uh, Paul learned, or as Saul, I guess, at that time, learned from the experience with Stephen. He must have heard, he must have heard that sermon uh, of, yeah. that uh, Stephen had. Oh, and, yeah. and here the guy, he knew that he was, those texts in the Bible, I'm thinking of Amos 5, 25, and 26, 27 in that range. I mean, it, it was, had to have put a different spin on the way Paul looked at things. Yeah. Well, and, and yet it still took a while for oh. Saul to rearrange things. Oh, yeah. It he still was Several on years. We're not side. talking about a, a yeah. short Bible study or yeah. seminary course. Yeah. It was years. Yeah. And we know that Paul talks about voting against Christians, which means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. If you're a member of the Sanhedrin, you were required to be married because they regarded that. It would, that would cause you to be more rounded in your thinking, more stable. More stable, stable. yeah. So he had to be at least 30 at that point in time uh, to be a member of the Sanhedrin. That's, of course, from the Bible. Um, there's some evidence that he was promoted to that position because of what he did in connection with the, with the stoning of Stephen and persecuting Christians after that. And that's possible. Um, but uh, stoning of Stephen, I believe, left a profound yeah. mark in his heart. Yeah. Even though he went on to Damascus or whatever, 
but that thing kept on pricking him and the Lord says, nah, I'm going to zap you. Yep. Um, Speaking of that experience, how long was it between the stoning of Stephen and the road to Damascus, do we know? Well, it can't be more than about a year because of the rest of the history that he gives us. Uh, so it probably about a year later. And there's something else interesting. Um, if you think about Judy, uh, Pharisaical in this case, even more than just Judy, Judaic, Pharisaical inhibitions and, and requirements, Paul would be traveling to Damascus with what other people? Roman soldiers. Probably Roman soldiers or, or maybe possibly Jewish soldiers who worked under the Roman government. He would not be allowed to even speak to them. Now we don't know, it's possible that he rode a horse that distance, but probably not. He probably walked. It's 130, 130 or 40 miles, something like that. 135 miles, I think. To, for that distance. Yeah. And all that time, he must have been thinking about Stephen. I'm guessing. Well, He's and possibly Jesus too. Yeah. He must have seen Jesus in the, in the temple and synagogue. Well, you know, there's a question about that. Anyway, read to us, Fred, I think you've got the next one there, Acts yeah. 26, 9 to 11, why we believe he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Yeah, uh, this from the Good News translation of the Bible, Acts 26, 9 to 11. I myself thought that I should do everything I could against the cause of Jesus of Nazareth. That is what I did in Jerusalem. I received authority from the chief priest and put many God's people in prison. And when they were sentenced to death, I also voted against them. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues and tried to make them deny their faith. I was so furious with them that I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. Wow. Well, this reminds me, I don't know if it reminds you, it reminds me of the story of the thief on the cross. What's the parallel between those two? Remember the thief on the cross, now this is from Ellen White, was there and this is the one who said, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Ellen White tells us that he, uh, earlier in his, in his life, he had, he had been convinced that Jesus was, he had seen Jesus, he'd followed him for a while and been convinced, and then he, would, he, he stepped back and he said, you know, it, 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 the, all of our leaders, all of our leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, can't be wrong about this Jesus. And so he turned against Jesus, he rebelled against him, and fell into terrible crime, and here he is now, and he's watching. Imagine being crucified beside Jesus, and he was observing everything there, and finally he says, no, this guy is not no ordinary human being. And what do we find out, what would be the parallel with Saul? Convinced by the teachings of the Pharisees. He was convinced by his, the teachings of the Pharisees, and the, maybe Gamaliel, we don't know, by the people there who said, no, this Jesus can't be, can't be right. He's terrible. He's whatever. Well, I mean, and think about the arguments. How could someone who hung on a Roman cross be the Jewish Messiah? I mean, Deuteronomy says you were cursed if you hang on a cross. And Jesus had been crucified. I mean, that's the worst possible punishment. It was thought to be the worst possible punishment in those days. Uh, and he, I mean, this was, this was a punishment that was reserved for traitors against the Roman government. How could a person who's crucified as a traitor against the Roman government be the Jewish Messiah? This does not seem possible. Charles, pick up the story there for us. Acts 9, 1 and 2. In the meantime, Saul kept up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked for the letters of introduction to the synagogues in, in Damascus, so that if he should find there any followers of the way of the Lord, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. So after having done as much damage as he possibly could to the Christian church in and around Jerusalem, 
He was looking for new territory in which to carry out his murderous plans. Damascus in the country of Syria, remember, Damascus was the, in those days, was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It's located not far from the coast, it's up a, little, a river up a little ways from the coast, but Rome was the biggest city, Alexandria and Egypt was second largest, and Damascus was the third, and of course it received all the trade coming out from the east, came down to, the, the logical place for it to come down into the Mediterranean was through Damascus. So it was a huge, very wealthy, I'm sure, powerful place, third largest in, in, the, in the Roman Empire. <coughs> Somehow or other, the Jewish Sanhedrin had convinced uh, the Roman government that they should have some amount of authority over Jews no matter where they lived. And so they felt that they had the right to send Paul over there to Damascus and to arrest Jews in Damascus that were professing to believe in Jesus. Well, the Sanhedrin, this is one of the things we need to be aware of, was in constant communication with the various Jewish communities throughout, through the use of letters commonly called um, I'm sorry, through the use of letters normally called, carried by a shaliah, one who was sent from the Hebrew, Hebrew shalal to sand. A shaliah was obviously designated by the Sanhedrin to carry out their wishes. So what's Paul doing? He has the official authority, he has the documents, he's a shaliah for the Sanhedrin. When Paul sought permission from the high priest to carry authority from the Sanhedrin to Damascus to persecute Christians, he became a shaliah sent by the Sanhedrin to destroy the Christian church in that area. Interestingly enough, the Greek equivalent of a shalia is an apostolos, from which we get the English word apostle. From being an apostle of the Sanhedrin, Paul became an apostle of Jesus Christ. Wow. Would it be fair to say that one of Paul's most important characteristics was zeal? We've already suggested that. Have you ever felt, felt you out there, ever felt real zeal for any cause, something that really just burns in you? What, what was it that inspired you? Think about that. And Gordon, I guess, Acts 9, you're going to take that on for us. In the Good News Bible, verses, nine, pardon me, verses 3 through 9, as Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from the sky flashed round him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? he asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecute, the voice said. But get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with Saul had stopped, not, not saying a word. They heard the voice but could not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground and opened his eyes but could not see a thing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days he was not able to see, and during that time he did not eat or drink anything. I think about an interesting parallel when I read this passage. Um, it says, Jesus, what did Jesus say to Paul? Why are you persecuting me? Yeah. Why are you persecuting me? Was he really persecuting Jesus? Well, not really, but in the person of his saints. Done Does that remind you? Done uh, to the least of these, you've done exactly. it unto me. Think of Matthew 25. If you've done it unto the least of these, so here's a proof that God, that Jesus regards it that way. So not just the positive, but the negative. Yeah. The road into Damascus. If you if you travel up the way, you go up to the Golan Heights and so forth. You go over like this, and you. You start down from the foothills of Mount Hermon to, uh, to Damascus. you you got a beautiful view out of there if, they're, if, they're, if the uh, bombs are not going off and other things like that. Paul was no doubt thinking about how, how he could arrest Christians. While Paul's companion heard a noise, and some of you may have run across this, there are critics who say, well, the Bible doesn't agree, because here it says they heard, they heard his voice, it says here they didn't, and other places it says they did. And it was one time Paul records it. Well, it's not a problem for anybody who understands Greek because in one place it says they heard the noise but they didn't understand. And the other place it says, yeah, Paul heard and understood. 
So it depends on the Greek form, and if it's translated properly, uh, there's no contradiction in that. So you might have heard someone argue about that. Well, suddenly Paul was struck down with this bright light. While Jesus, while Paul's companions heard a noise, only Paul apparently heard the verbal message from Jesus himself, and that's in Acts 22, 7 and 8. To Paul himself, this was a very important moment. From then on in his life, he considered himself to have been commissioned by Jesus himself to do his work. There's a couple of passages about that. Let's look at just a couple really quick. 1 Corinthians 9, 1. Am I not a free man? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord? And aren't you the result of my work for the Lord? So he was pretty convinced of that, wasn't he? And look at 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone who was born, whose birth was abnormal. Why would he say that? <coughs> he wasn't one of the disciples. He wasn't there with the crowds following Jesus during those early days. Someone born out of time. Well, what do you think? Do, we, do you think those couple of sentences we have there is the whole conversation we had between Jesus and Paul and Saul? No. 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 I'm sure it must be more. And what do you think? Do you think uh, that was the only time God spoke to him or did he speak to him other times? Somewhere, I think in First uh, Corinthians 7, somewhere there, the Lord, uh, Paul says, look, I don't have any direct instruction from the Lord, but this is what I think is going on. Yeah. So, um, he also, in addition to that, which is important, he also mentions one place, I was taken up to the third heaven and I saw things and so forth, which I can't explain to you. So clearly, Paul had other visions later in his Christian experience. But when he was struck down, that's what interests me. Uh, it says, who are you, Lord? Yeah. Uh, he, he, it was, he never saw Jesus. Uh, but who are you? Mm -hmm. uh, and then he, well, he gets up, suddenly he cannot see. We have a parallel in the Old Testament, and that's uh, Jacob at, uh, at uh, Jabbok River. Oh, yes where, let me go, sun is coming up. So he touches the yep. hip and dislocates it. He says, let me tell you, I'm the boss. Yeah. You know, same way with uh, Saul. Uh, well, he cannot see for whatever time. He didn't know. He thought maybe he's going to be blind for the rest of his life. Yeah. Myra, I think you have something to add there. This is from Acts of the Apostles, page 112, paragraph 2 to 113. Saul had taken a prominent part in the trial and conviction of Stephen, and the striking evidences of God's presence with the martyr had led Saul to doubt the righteousness of the cause he had opposed against the followers of Jesus. His mind was deeply stirred. In his perplexity, he appealed to those in whose wisdom and judgment he had full confidence. The arguments of the priests and the rulers finally convinced him that Stephen was a blasphemer, that Christ, whom the martyred disciple had preached, was an imposter, and those who were ministering in the holy office must be right. Acts of the Apostles, 112 and 113. So obviously here we have a clear picture of a, of a battle going on in Paul's mind. He's struggling. Well, think about how you might feel if you were struck down with a bright light and Jesus himself was talking to you. Well, and also <clears throat> leading you to a message that is so different from the one he had come to believe from the leaders of his religion. Would, would you be prepared to say, as Paul did, what do you want me to do, Lord? Well, we have the benefit of having this story. <laughs> He, he didn't have such a story to, yeah. to prepare him that this might happen. I, I, I can't imagine the, how do you even comprehend what's happening? You're yeah. so startled. Yeah. The power of indoctrination yeah. is incredible, especially when it comes to religion. And uh, the, what Paul went through could very well be what we need to get through before the return of the Lord. Yeah. Well... 
Paul was led into the city, blinded by the light, and taken to a house on Straight Street. Believe it or not, some of you are aware that Straight Street is still there. There are some, of course it's a Muslim place stronghold now, but there are some small chapels sort of hidden away on Straight Street that they claim, of course, were the place where Paul was kept by uh, in, that, in that spot. We don't know for sure, but at least the street is still quite certain that it's the actual straight street. A long, very narrow, long street. So that's probably what was called straight street. So what happened next, Jim? X10, excuse me, X9, 10 to 19. There was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. He had a vision in which the Lord said to him, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, Get ready and go to Straight Street, and at the house of Judas ask for the man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. And in a vision he had seen a man named Ananias come in and placed his hands on him so that he might see again. Ananias answered, Lord, many people have told me about this man and about all the terrible things he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come to Damascus with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who worship you. The Lord said to him, Go, because I have chosen him to serve me, to make my name known to Gentiles and kings and to the people of Israel. And I myself will show him all that he must suffer for my sake. So Ananias went, entered the house where Saul was, placed his hands on him, but as all he said, the Lord has sent me, Jesus himself, who appeared to you on the road as you were roaming, as you were coming here. He sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And once some, excuse me, and once something like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes, he was able to see again. He stood up and was baptized. And after he had eaten, his strength came back. Good news, Bible. Acts 10, 9, 10 to 19. I want you to think about that for a moment. You know, you're Ananias, and you're, you, you're thinking, you know, I, am I going to live through this experience? Uh, How do I keep my... Uh, our president saying, going, go to the worst terrorists we yeah. have in this world and tell yeah. them that God sent me and he's praying. I... <laughs> <laughs> Would you have the courage? I mean, it's just like... Ananias was a strong man. That's uh, you, a good faith. Are you, are you are, Lord? Are you asking me to jump into a lion's den here? Or what, <laughs> what, what? What is this? And then we noticed that uh, Paul went through a series of fifty-six lessons, yeah. weekly lessons, until yeah. he was baptized. Yes, exactly. <laughs> or was it fifty sec fifty-six seconds until he was baptized? Yeah. <laughs> he stood up and he was baptized. Here's the question I would really like to think about. At that point in time. Do you think it would have been a bigger shock to Paul's compatriots, Saul's friends back in Jerusalem, or even to the Jews in Damascus, that he had become a Christian, or that God was sending him to preach the gospel to Gentiles? But he was also giving the message to the Jews, too. Yeah, sure. So, so it, that, they wouldn't be surprised about that. Well, <laughs> that's the Christian part. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. I think that the message to the Gentiles is a little bit more of a paradigm shift. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, the Gentiles um, didn't know God at all. And it's perhaps more difficult for somebody who's been indoctrinated into a certain view of God yeah. than to suddenly find out what God, the true God, is really all about. So maybe it's not... Do you think during those three days when Paul wasn't eating or, 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 or drinking water at all, did he pray to Jesus saying, Lord, if you want me to be your servant, I think I need to know something. <laughs> How about come back and talk to me again? huh? Well, this concept of God probably wasn't all that uh, developed. Because I'm sure he didn't say it wasn't at that time praying to Jesus. He was... Yeah. He, he was Yahweh or whatever his concept of God was, but what they—I wonder if he had a prayer book even back then. You know, they, they 
canned prayers, so to speak, and uh, uh, he had them memorized. I sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, picking up the next part of the story, we go to Galatians one, verse one, and verses eleven to twelve. From Paul, who's called to be an apostle, did not come from human beings or by human means, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from death. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any human being, nor did anyone teach it to me. It was Jesus Christ himself who revealed it to me. Why did he need to make those powerful statements? Oh, it seems like I remember there were s different stories going around about the different teachers, and I follow Gamaliel, and I follow, and he wanted them to know that this didn't come from Gamaliel or someone else that he had talked to. It wasn't of human origin. Yeah. yeah. It was also the, the question of authority. Those who had direct contact with Jesus had, yeah. Yeah. were up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those who didn't <coughs> were down here. Yeah. Paul is saying, I'm up here. Jesus personally called me, talks to me. Yeah. So let's just think about that for a moment. If Paul later is speaking to Gentiles, would it be more impressive to them, to them to, for Paul to say, well, there's a bunch of um, Jewish disciples back there in Palestine that sent me. Or would it be more impressive to them to say, I received a message, and this is how it happened, directly from God, and God has told me I, come, I need to come and tell you. I think clearly God was giving him a, a, a way to say, you know, this is a message from God himself. Um, and it had to have the ring of truth. It's yeah. one thing to come in, uh, I've got the, my collar put on the right way, I've got the bright books. <laughs> it, a ring of truth uh, it had to strike a chord with him had a new identity that he'd lost before yeah. when he was a murderer and at the top of his game all of a sudden he lost it and then this came and it was the stamp of approval. Well when Jesus was out preaching for yeah. his ministry, what was it? It was truth. It wasn't his appearance. It wasn't his entourage. It was truth, that, that, uh, which is the spirit of truth, uh, is what, uh, what his message was. Yeah, yeah. Well. Certainly, I, 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 someday we'll get to hear Paul make, a pres make his presentations. Well, he's done a pretty good job yeah, here. <laughs> pretty good job. But clearly, we don't have many of sermons directly to pagan. Uh, we, have, we have the one in, of, at Athens. And we have his comments about some of the things he said to others. But we don't have many of his sermons directly to pagans. I suspect that he made capital of this kind of experience. He must have said, Look, let me tell you what happened to me. And people are, whoa, mm -hmm. you know. They, I, I, I don't know how you would not be impressed by a story like that. Well, it was a, he had that, his own personal testimony, but also he has a message about somebody that had died and rose back to life and re apparently raised some others back to life. Yeah. That it was part of his story. Well, the next three years of Paul's life was divided between preaching the gospel at Damascus. Remember, he preached there for a while until they very got, got very upset at him. He said, okay, let me leave for a while. He went out into the Arabian desert. We don't know where or what he was doing out there except obviously meditating and praying and so forth like this. And then he came back to Damascus with an even more powerful message. And what did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. Really, really. And... Uh, Kerry, I think you have some words about what he was doing out there. Yes. Here in the solitude of the desert, Paul had ample opportunity for quiet study and meditation. He calmly reviewed his past experience and made sure work of repentance. He sought God with all his heart, resting not until he knew for certainty that his repentance was accepted and his sin pardoned. He longed for the assurance that Jesus would be with him in his coming ministry. He emptied his soul of the prejudices and traditions that had hitherto shaped his life and received instruction from the source of truth. Jesus communed with him and established him in the faith, bestowing upon him a rich measure of wisdom and grace. 
It came from Acts of the Apostles, page 125, paragraph 3 through 126. Here we have clear evidence that he wasn't out there just sort of, I mean, he had a fruit basket upset, let's be honest. That, yeah. He had to rethink everything, but he wasn't doing it by himself. He had direct communication from God, probably on a pretty regular, maybe even daily basis, saying, you know, God, show me, what, how, how do I understand this passage? What's, what's going on over here? How do I understand these stories that I've known since I was a small child from the Old Testament? Give me a clear picture. I'm, I'm, I would love to have that kind of experience. So is that where Galatians 1.12 comes from? It was Jesus Christ himself who revealed it to me that you read just a couple Probably. minutes ago? Probably. It's from the, from the Arabian Desert. Well, when, when you think of what happened to Paul later in his career, he was flogged to the point of death. He nearly drowned. He shipwrecked the whole bit. Jesus had to have been with him to keep him alive. Yeah. Is there no other Charles? reason? No. Yeah. Th this was his 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah. 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 And, and Ellen White so eloquently puts it together. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in yeah. contemplating the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah. How beautiful. Are we ever going to get that strength? Yes, he will. Uh, I think in our lifetime we will going to see things happening. Yeah. Wow. Well, try to imagine how you would feel if you were a faithful Jew. You knew. I mean, you had the, the words from Abraham, and they've come down to the generations. They've stood the test of time, and now you're in Damascus, and you are you know, a faithful Jew, and suddenly here shows up somebody who is a former Pharisee, who knows his Bible forward and backward, and he says, all the things that you have believed are wrong. How would you respond? Well, isn't that the way Jesus started his ministry as well? Yeah. You have been told, but I tell you. And, uh, there's a follow-up to that story. But not a, what is it, yacht or tittle was, was ch of the, done away with the law. It's his in interpretation. Yeah. You've heard it said that, that. That's beautiful. Well, it's possible that Paul may be one of those who tried to defeat Stephen in the synagogues of the freedmen. Remember it said that the, one of those synagogues was people who came from Cilicia, and that was, that was Paul's territory. That's where he came from. So he would go there and with his friends, and now guess who it is that's defeating all the opponents to Christianity? It's Paul. Uh, Fred, I think you've got something on that. Yes, in Acts 6, um, verses 9 and 10, this is from the Good News Bible. We are told, uh, but he, that is Stephen, was opposed by some men who were members of the synagogue of the freed men as it was called, which included Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. Those would be in North Africa. They and other Jews from the provinces of Cilicia and Asia started arguing with Stephen. But the Spirit gave Stephen such wisdom that when he spoke, they could not refute him. Wow. And now who's the Stephen in the crowd? It's Paul. Now he's, he's preaching probably even, if anything, more powerful than what Stephen was, had been doing. Don't you think that on his way to Damascus, he wasn't thinking about that message of Stephen, which then came <laughs> with power from the mouth of the Lord himself? Yeah. Well, the Jews, you know, and this is, this is not exclusive to Jews by any means. If you can't beat them by argument, what do you do? Kill them. And what do they have to do? They let him down through a window in a basket. This is one of the arguments for the idea that Paul, Paulus means a small, something small. And of course, that would be his Greek name as opposed to his Hebrew name, which was Saul. Um, but imagine somebody really quietly in the middle of the night, <laughs> letting him down in a basket through one of the windows, because there were, there were guards at every gate. Well, there, then he returned to Jerusalem. Now, the next thing I want you to think about is this. Suppose that you were walking with Paul. 
back to Jerusalem. You've been gone for three years. Think of all that's happened to you. You know what things are like in Jerusalem, right? Your wife is there. Your former friends and patriots and so forth and the Sanhedrin were there. And then there were those Christians that you had been persecuting. What, would, what do you think was going through his mind? Nobody likes me. Yeah, <laughs> that's about right. <coughs> no one would have believed his story. I mean, you what? What happened to you? Oh, do you think Paul talked to his wife? Had he, did he try to communicate with her in any way during his absence? What do, what do you think those Roman soldiers, or the Jew, even if they were Jewish soldiers, after Paul became a Christian, what could they do other than just go back to Jerusalem? And what, what kind of a story do you think they told? The guy had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Well, we know what actually did happen when they got when he got back to Jerusalem, Charles. So what did happen? Acts nine twenty six to thirty. Saul went to Jerusalem and tried to join the disciples. Tried. <laughs> yeah, tried. I like that. But they would not believe him that he was the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. And then I Barnabas. <laughs> the Barnabas came to him, help him, to his help and took him to the apostles. He explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had spoken to him. He also told them how boldly Saul had preached in the name of the Lord Jesus in Damascus. And so Saul stayed with them and went all over Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He also talked and disputed with the Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers found out about this, they took Saul to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. 31st? Yeah. Also? All right. And so it was that the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had a time of peace through the help of the Holy Spirit, it was strengthened and grew in numbers as it lived in reverence for the Lord. Now, this is very interesting. I want you to look at this. What happened when, when Stephen had preached the message three years earlier? What was the result? He was stoned, and then what happened? Persecution. A terrible persecution against the Christians. What happens here? Paul goes around to Jerusalem. And, I mean, I, I, I try to picture these things in my mind, and I hope you all do that do too. You know, one day he shows up at the synagogue, and people are looking at him. You look kind of familiar. <laughs> Weren't you the guy who used to be arguing against Stephen? Ah, uh, but I have a message for you. Okay, well, speak up. Whoa, that's not what we expected coming out of your mouth, right? And he must have gone from place to place uh, with that kind of a message. Well, once, a, once again, we, find, and I, we have to mention Barnabas in passing. He served as a key role in this church in Jerusalem. Well, unfortunately, it was very hard for the disciples of Jesus and the other Christian believers in Jerusalem ever to fully accept Paul's commission to spread the gospel to Gentiles. Okay, yeah, just don't convert too many of those Gentiles. What would we do if the Christian church became more a Gentile church instead of a Jewish church? We can't let that happen. Paul, you're messing things up for us. Certainly we don't have anything like that today, do we? <laughs> Nothing like yeah. that could happen. <laughs> well, they must have felt that it was at least partly wrong for Paul to so completely leave his commitment to Judaism. You were the Pharisee. Why can't you focus on Jews? Why do you need to talk to those Gentiles? Well, years later, it was the Christian believers in Jerusalem who persuaded Paul to shave his head. The Christian believers who convinced Paul to shave his head, go to the temple with four other believers. It was there on the last day of that commitment 
that Paul was spotted and arrested and spent most of the rest of his life in prison. It was the Jew, it was the Christian Jews, the Christian believers that asked him to do that. Wow. They were more Jewish than Christian. That seems like it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, Gordon, I think you have some comments about that. From Acts of the Apostles, page 124, paragraph 2. A general slain in battle is lost to his army, but his death gives no additional strength to the enemy. But when a man of prominence joins the opposing force, not only are his services lost, but those to whom he joins gain a decided advantage. Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, might easily have been struck dead by the Lord, and much strength would have been withdrawn from the persecuting power. But God, in his providence, not only spared Saul's life, but converted him, thus transferring a champion from the side of the enemy to the side of Christ. An eloquent speaker and a severe critic, Paul, with his stern purpose and undaunted courage, possessed the very qualifications needed in the early church. Acts of the Apostles 124. Do you think Paul told them any secrets from the Sanhedrin? Do you think, well, you know, she talks about, you know, you would think in, in, a, in a military situation of a, of, of a general leaves this side and joins that side, they're going to say, okay, what, what do you know about their plans? What's going on? Like, you know, you, th you think about that. What, did, did Paul know anything about the Sanhedrin plans and how they were going to deal, deal with things? And I believe that even if he knew the excitement of the gospel was so much more that it really, truly, I mean, it, it, it controlled him from yeah. that time on, yeah. that those things really didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Well, Myra, I think you had something to add there. Yes, from Ellen White's sketches from the life of Paul. Christ had commanded his disciples to go and teach all nations. But the previous teachings which they had received from the Jews made it difficult for them to fully comprehend the words of their master. And therefore, they were slow to act upon them. They called themselves the children of Abraham and regarded themselves as the heirs of divine promise. It was not until several years after the Lord's ascension that their minds were sufficiently expanded to clearly understand the intent of Christ's words and they were to labor for the conversions of the Gentiles as well as to the mm. as well as to those of the Jews. Their minds were particularly called out of this part of the work by for part of the work by the Gentiles themselves, many of whom embraced the doctrine of Christ. Soon after the death of Stephen and the consequent scattering of the believers throughout Palestine, Samaria was greatly stirred. The Samaritans received the believers kindly and manifest a willingness to hear a willingness to hear concerning Jesus, who in his first public labors had preached to them with great power. Page thirty-eight, chapter er, yeah, chapter two and thirty-nine of sketches from. Very there. good. Okay, so. Why do you think the Samaritans were so much more willing to receive the Christianity, basically, and, and go in it than the Jews were? They didn't have the, par the prejudices that as, as much as the Jews did. And Jesus had come there and had spent a bunch of time planting seed and watering it. And he had, he had healed yeah. a number of Samaritans that we know about. The so woman at the well of the woman Samaria. The well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, now that we have reviewed the history of Paul, at least from through his early years and his conversion, why do you think he made the following statement? Paul described himself as the least of the apostles. This First Corinthians fifteen nine, but no single person wa <coughs> was as influential as Paul in taking the gospel, the good news about Jesus to the world. This least of the apostles crossed the most frontiers to spread the gospel 
established the most churches and wrote the most texts in Christian theology. Wow. As in one individual. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, why, why did Paul think he needed to make a statement like that? I am the least of all the apostles. He didn't hesitate to say, I got my message straight from the Lord. So why would he call himself the yes, Gordon? So this, I'm the least, reminds me of at the end of the millennium, a number of years back, Time Magazine had the most influential people of the second millennium after Christ. The oh, really? 1,000 to 2,000. And mm -hmm. Martin Luther was one of those. Don't you think that Paul would have been very high on the list uh, well, of right. the first millennium mm -hmm. after Jesus, probably? Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But he had his memories. Yeah. The greatest thing to me is that he did not care for the position. Yeah. That's why he called himself the least. Yeah. I really don't care what's happening in Jerusalem. I've been called by the Lord himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, probably he called himself the least because he remembers what he did in his early years. Mm. That's probably the largest single factor. That would be a real bur burden throughout your <coughs> life yeah. to think that you... I mean, to think that you killed people, Christians, you, and you, you, you arrested them and had them killed killed that great preacher, Stephen. Yeah. yeah. You might say he was not in love with himself. Yes. No, he wasn't. Well, he No, said but he had spent time, it said he spent time until he f felt fully pardoned and forgiven and... Yeah. Well, can you think of others who made a great impact on the spread of the gospel who consider themselves of lesser importance? One obvious example is John the Baptist. What did he say? He must increase and I must decrease. What about Ellen White's comments about herself? The Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept, I'm reading now from Ellen White, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Oh, how much good would be accomplished if the books containing this light were read with the determination to carry out the principles they contain. There would be a thousandfold greater vigilance, a thousandfold more self-denial and resolute effort, and many more would be rejoicing in the light of present truth. She wrote that Review and Herald, January 20, 1903. Wow. Well, I have so, a question. Hmm? Yeah. I have a question. It's not only here, all over. I just came from Asia not long ago. Uh, we don't uh, we don't quote uh, Helen White anymore from the pulpit. And how much do we read? I've, if we surveyed our young people, how many of them even know that there's a book called Great Controversy and these are pages? Uh, that is so sad. It is so sad. And yet we quote philosophers, poets, yeah. current Christian writers, yes. but not Ellen White. Well, sometimes we quote her and we say, someone once said, or <laughs> an important person in our early church history said. <laughs> I mean... Well, they, uh, I remember reading something about, uh, it was a Battle Creek or whatever, they, were, they would teach the Greek philosophers mm -hmm. in their study of, of Greek rather than the, the Greek the of, the, of the Bible. Yeah. I mean, this is, what, a hundred and some years ago? I will say, from my own experience with my daughter, who is, you know, what, 38. Shh, not supposed to tell. <laughs> I had her when I was 10. No, uh, <laughs> Um, they're doing a Bible study of the Great Controversy, the book, Beautiful. and a group of her and her friends. So it's not totally lost, yeah. but it is it's diminished. Okay. It's diminished. Carrie, I think you're next. Yes. When Christ revealed himself to Paul and he was convinced that he was persecuting Jesus in the person of his saints, he accepted the truth as it is in Jesus. 
a transforming power was manifested on mind and character, and he became a new man in Christ Jesus. He received the truth so fully that neither earth nor hell could shake his faith. That wow. comes from selected messages. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the earliest references we, we've seen now, that the earliest references we have about Paul or Saul or Paul talk about his opposition to Christianity. You can read Acts 7, the end of Acts 7, chapter 8 and 9, 1. Ellen White described the experience of Paul as, of Paul as follows. Um, Fred? Yes, in Acts of the Apostles, page 102, she says, After the death of Stephen, Saul was elected a member of the Sanhedrin Council and consider, in consideration of the part that he had acted on that occasion. For a time, he was a mighty instrument in the hands of Satan to carry out his rebellion against the Son of God. But soon, his, this relentless persecutor was to be employed in building up the church that he was now tearing down. A mighty, mightier than Satan had chosen Saul to take the place of martyred Stephen to preach and suffer for his sake, for his name, and to spread far and wide the tidings of salvation through his blood. I want to ask you a quick question. We're running out of time here, but imagine yourself now in the councils of Satan in heaven right after the Damascus Road. What, what did, <laughs> I'm sure Satan was so mad. God, you can't do that. This is my prime guy. You used force, God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Gamaliel had Solomon Paul as a student and mentee. It was Gamaliel who had convinced the Sanhedrin not to kill Peter and John and so forth, we know. And reading through Acts 7 and 9, we gather additional information about those early years of Paul's conversion in Galatians 1, 15 to 24. Paul was welcomed to the Christian community by Aeneas, uh, Ananias I'm sorry, in Damascus, who went on to baptize him. Paul then began to preach convincingly in Damascus about Jesus. But being the careful student that he was, he left for Arabia and spent some time in meditation and prayer. What would happen to us? We're running out of time. What would happen to us as Christians if each one of us determined to take some time doing that? Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to think about you, to talk about you, to speak about you among friends, to realize that these incredible messages have been preserved for us in the writings all the way back from New Testament times and up to modern times in your modern prophet. We believe that a time that's coming before us very soon will be times of maybe greater danger than there were in the days of Paul. There will be Satan putting forth his last great effort to destroy your church. May we be, though, among those who will stand straight and tall and faithful to you during those difficult times is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.